Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live. Clean Machine Live, actually. Yes, Clean Machine Live. That's me. <laughs> I'm Jeff Palmer, CEO and founder of Clean Machine. Today, we're going to be talking about prostate health, <clears throat> why it's so important, why the uh, prostate issues are increasing at an alarming rate, um, and what we can do about it uh, with diet and nutrition. Um, so we're going to take a look at some of the uh, downsides of what diet has uh, been linked to and then take a look at what can we do uh, on the plant side uh, and nutrition side uh, to offset any uh, potential negative effects to um, prostate health. <clears throat> So uh, let's um, jump right into this. Um, but before I get started, the disclaimer, this video is for informational educational purposes only, and it's not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Since we are gonna be looking at some research that talks about uh, prostate cancer specifically, I wanna make it clear um, <clears throat> that what I'm gonna be talking about uh, is overall prostate health, but using the studies on uh, prostate uh, disease states like BPH and cancer um, as just as an educational reference point for you. So again, we're not um, making any claims that uh, any uh, nutritional um, approaches are going to treat, cure, diagnose, prevent any disease, including prostate cancer or BPH, benign prostate hyperplasia. Okay, <clears throat> so in the title of the first one, we're uh, look at a 43% uh, risk of cancer. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the chat box for you so you guys can see where that was coming from. It was published in the um, Journal of Cancer Prevention Research, and I'll put that up on the screen too, um, so everyone can see it. <clears throat> and this one was one of the earlier ones back in uh, 2000, I believe, or 2001, <coughs> that uh, looked at dietary patterns after prostate cancer diagnosis in relation to disease-specific mortality. I'll go ahead and put that on the screen for you. So this is the study that we're talking about here and they found that men who ate a mostly Western diet, which is a meat-centric diet, had two and a half times higher risk for prostate cancer-related death. Death, not just getting prostate cancer, but dying from it. Two and a half times higher risk. So this is a challenge. Um, we know that a meat-centric diet, an animal-centric diet, animal food centric diet um, does significantly. And there's lots of studies out there. You don't have to just reference this study. There's plenty of studies out there um, showing that. Um, so the question then, this was mostly looking at meat, <clears throat> specifically more red meat and showing that consuming red meat had a much higher risk, two and a half times, 2.5 four, seven, I think was the actual uh, reference point, uh, but to roughly two and a half times cancer, prostate cancer death, not just getting prostate, but dying from it. Now that should be uh, caution enough to, um, to actually consider, especially if you're aging, um, where more of the prostate problems uh, become an issue for most men, which is the ages of 40 and onward. Um, but you know, we should be taking a look at dietary um, considerations. So what about vegetarians? So the next question is, okay, what if we eliminate red meat? What about vegetarians who eat uh, eggs and dairy? So let's take a look at this study. But before I jump into the dairy research, because we're going to look at a couple of different studies, I want to put this banner um, uh, up on the screen because it's it's pretty eye-opening. This is a Harvard University study that said eating two and a half eggs a week, not a day, a week, increases prostate cancer by 81%. This is, these are 
big numbers. This is not a minor risk that you can weigh and say, well, I like my eggs and it's not much of a risk, so I'll take my chances. 81% increased risk just by two and a half eggs a week. So this is this is definitely something to consider when choosing your foods about where your risks are at. <laughs> okay, so next, that's eggs. Let's take a look at dairy. Well, this is a 2001 study and it shows, well, I'll go ahead and put it up here. It's uh, published in the American Journal of uh, <clears throat> Cancer, uh, Cancer Research, I believe. The, uh, I'm sorry, that's wrong. It's uh, the AGCN, but I'm gonna go ahead and put it in the thing so you can, you can see the link and you can see the study for yourself. I'll pull it up on the screen. So in this study, dairy products, calcium, and prostate cancer risk in the Physician's Health Study link. So um, this is an interesting one because it looked at both not only dairy, but dairy calcium and seeing if it's maybe the calcium that is increasing the prostate cancer risk. And they found men consuming um, dairy did have a 32% higher risk of prostate cancer. And their conclusions were these results support the hypothesis that dairy products and calcium are associated with greater risk of prostate. So uh, the next study I'm going to go into is going to kind of rebut this a little bit. So they were combining uh, dairy and calcium and conflating the results of the dairy impact. Was it really the dairy? Was it really the calcium or was it more the dairy? And that's why this study, uh, the study I'm going to show you in just a moment, is going to actually tease that out. It's going to separate the calcium intake and um, either from animal source or plant source and see if that's a contributor, if there's a difference maker there. Um, so the study of uh, uh, dairy products intake and cancer mortality risk. Now this is a meta-analysis. It's looking at 11 population-based cohort studies. Um, so this study actually found a significant, now the first study it said 32% risk. This one is later, 15 years later, in 2016, and what did they find? So this is 15 years later. This is how the research can change over time. Um, so Let's see, let's put it up here. So dairy product intake and cancer mortality risk, a meta-analysis looking at 11 different studies and that they found further dose response analysis was performed. We found that an increase of whole milk induced elevated prostate cancer mortality significantly with the risk of prostate cancer 43%. So that first study went 32%. Now we're up to 43% based on dairy consumption. Well, that, that would be scary enough as it is because now we're 15 years later looking at data that is saying, no way, it, actually it could be a lot higher risk of uh, prostate cancer. Um, so let's look at the final study, which actually separates out calcium. Remember that first study that showed 32% risk, increased risk, and then blamed it on not only dairy, but calcium. Is calcium really a contributor? This study actually separates it out. Um, so I'll put the study up first. It's a big study. It's an Adventist health study. So um, the Adventist health is really kind of a cool group of study because it's actually looking at large populations inclusive of those on a plant exclusive diet. Um, uh, plant exclusive, not plant based, but plants only. Um, so it gives us some unique data that you wouldn't get in general population studies because you're not teasing out which of the people that are vegan uh, or purely plant placed and those who are eating a standard American diet or meat centric animal based 
product-centric diet. Okay, so dairy, this is the title of it. Uh, study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Um, big study, 28,000, almost 29,000 men, and good time amount too, 7.8 uh, years, almost eight years of follow-up. So good length of time, good amount of people in the study, and actually inclusive of vegans as well. So really good study. And remember, this has just come out in June of 2022. So just came out this month, published this month. And it's called Dairy Foods Calcium Intakes. Remember that other study suggesting that it may be the calcium that is causing the problem. This one actually pulled those out and see if there was any difference with or without the calcium and the risks of incidence of prostate cancer in the Adventist Health Study too. So what did they find out? Well, the first thing that they found out was this. And I'll put that up on the screen. And here's their thing, that there was no evidence of effect of higher uh, calcium compared with lower intakes of non-dairy calcium. So making it very clear, non-dairy calcium. So it's not the calcium itself that is related to it. It is the dairy, not the calcium. So contradicting that study that was uh, way back in uh, uh, 2001, now we have 21 years later, a study that really teases that out and gives us some better information. Um, so here is what they found in the conclusions from this study. And this is a study just published this month, remember. I'll go ahead and put the results of this study and the conclusions of this study, which are actually pretty disturbing. So men with higher takes intakes of dairy food, but not non-dairy calcium. So this suggesting that it's not the non-dairy calcium. So calcium found in non-dairy uh, beverages like almond milk and oat milk, not an issue uh, for contributing at all to contributing to prostate cancer. It is specifically the dairy. Um, had a higher risk of prostate cancer compared with men with lower intakes. Associations were non-linear. Non that means the more you intake, usually a linear is the more you intake or dose responsive is the more you intake, the higher the rates go. Suggesting, a quote, suggesting greatest increased risk is at relatively low doses. So even a little bit of dairy, can be a big contributor to prostate risk of health. At least that's what this study is suggesting. So the results of that were calibrated dairy regressions, all participants and all prostate cancers, adjusting for dietary measurement error, found a higher risk, HR, of 75% increased risk of prostate cancer. 75%, that's almost as bad as the eggs at 81%. So you can see when you're contributing eggs and dairy to your diet, or, and on top of that, a meat-based diet, which is pretty universally known uh, that red meat contributes to the elevated risk of prostate cancer. You're getting a triple whammy from the eggs, 81% increase, dairy, 75% increase, and meat, which is resoundingly determined to be uh, a contributor to prostate cancer. Now you're putting yourself almost at, at, at un, very unfavorable risk to getting prostate cancer. Um, so this is one of the fastest growing cancer death rates of, of men in the United States. And it's, it's something that we can potentially, based on the research, do something about as far as choosing what foods we put into our mouth. Okay, so that part is clear. Um, but what can we do about it? Well, the good news is that we, uh, there are some nice research out there saying nu nutritionally that we may be able to um, help improve uh, our prostate health. Uh, I'm going to put this uh, first study up on the board, but there are many studies on this category, which is vitamin D3. So this vitamin D3 study said, 
low vitamin D status is associated with inflammation in patients with prostate cancer. So the vitamin D deficiency has been associated with increased risks of prostate cancer. So getting your vitamin D is probably a good idea in um, at least uh, possibly and potentially improving prostate health. We wanna make sure at least we're in sufficient status. And for most of us inside, that uh, means um, taking a vitamin D3 supplement. That's one of the reasons why I made this. I'm, you know, in my 60th year of life, I'm male. Prostate uh, cancer is uh, a killer of a lot of people in my age. I've known people who have died from it. I don't want to go down that path. Um, so definitely I created that. Now, uh, I was looking obviously for a vegan source of um, vegan D3, um, and I found one called veg d3 now what's unique about veg d3 is veg d3 is actually the very first 100 percent pure crystallized form of d3 that is it pure d3 and it's from an organic source so it's from organic algae this is the first d3 on the market to be 100 percent pure and to be from an organic source of algae so that's why i went with it because for me that's what i'm looking for it is the best source as far as my opinion goes for vitamin d3 that's why i take it every day um so what else can we do well let's look at uh does animal protein contribute to um uh to prostate health and does mTOR C1 what is mTOR C1 mTOR C1 is the mechanism by which uh people all humans actually uh, I think all animals too as well um build a muscle tissue okay so it is part of the machinery of muscle growth but just like healthy cell growth uh, IGF-1 and mTOR-C1 in stimulated in unhealthy cells or aberrant cells, cancer cells. You don't want them growing. So you don't want overstimulation of these through IGF-1 or mTOR because you can stimulate the growth of cancer cells as well as the growth of healthy cells. So let's take a look at that. So, um, Here's one, let's talk about uh, dairy and its potential for prostate through mTOR pathway. I'll put this one up on the screen. Okay, so this study is dairy products. Is there an impact on promotion of prostate cancer? A review of the literature. So this is a literary review paper. And in this paper, quote, there is a direct relationship between mTOR C1 activation and prostate cancer. Several ingredients in milk and dairy products, when in high in concentrations, increase the signaling of the mTOR C1 pathway. So this is one of the mechanisms that dairy is using uh, that uh, stimulate this. Now, remember what dairy is. Dairy is made for a baby calf at 60 pounds at birth to gain up to 600 pounds and grow into a full adult. That's what it needs to do. Massive amount of growth, lots of cell, cell stimulation to increase a lot of growth. Us adult humans, we don't need to gain 600 pounds. So we're sending these massive amounts of grow, grow, grow signals to our cells and our cells are saying, ah, don't need, you're a full adult. You don't need to grow like crazy. You don't need to add 600 pounds of, of, of muscle. No, that's, this is not gonna happen. Um, our body even prevents that from happening. So when you have that abundance of grow, grow, grow cell signaling, especially through mTOR C1, you have the potential to tell cancer cells to grow. And when you accelerate the growth of cancer cell, it metastasizes. And that's what most people die from. About 90% of uh, cancers are from uh, metastasization. Okay. So the study goes on to say, and I'll, I'll read it from a quote, persistent hyperactivation 
of mTOR C1 is associated with prostate cancer promotion. But mTOR, here's my notes, but mTOR is actually used for muscle growth and repair, same as IGF-1. IGF-1 and mTOR both go up when you work out. Does that mean working out causes cancer? No, of course not, because that is appropriate activation of mTOR and of IGF-1. Now, what you don't want is to be sedentary, have no reason for the body to grow, and then send heavy cell signaling, like from dairy, eggs, and, and, and animal proteins, especially meat, sending these heavy signaling sections when you are creating no demand for growth by working out. That's the lethal combination, not exercising and eating a high animal-based diet. Grow, 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 no exercise, no, no, no. Okay, the cancer cells then get the signals and they grow, grow, grow. And that's where you have the issue. So mTOR and IGF-1 are necessary. mTOR and IGF-1 go up when we sleep. mTOR and IGF-1 go up when we exercise. Sleep and exercise are really important for our health. So it's not these pathways that are wrong. It's the overstimulation of these pathways when we're in a sedentary state. If you are regularly exercising, you need those pathways to promote uh, protein turnover, healing and repairing, and muscle growth and replacement of damaged cells senescence, this turnover of cells that are weak or damaged or have bad DNA in them, you want that turnover. But what you don't want is being sedentary, having no reason for your body to actually grow or accelerate growth at a, a, at a low level because you're not creating the demand through exercise and then sending a bunch of growth signals by a heavy animal-based diet, including eggs, dairy, and meat. So that's the big difference. All right, so let's take a look what happens when you do this. This next study looked at IGF-1 in plants versus animals. Put this one up on the screen. Okay, so this one, uh, the IGF-1 plant versus animal study. Okay, so this study is low protein intake is associated with a major reduction in IGF-1, cancer, and overall mortality. So this is saying that, okay, well, maybe uh, this high protein intake that we're doing, if we don't really need it, is giving us too much protein. And that protein is sending IGF-1, which then can promote cancer growth. Now, interesting, the study goes on in the title of the study, increase cancer and overall mortality in the 65 and younger, but not the older population. Why is that? Because as we age, it is now, now known that as we age, once we get to 60, 65 years of age, we actually require more protein uh, to stimulate the same amount of growth. I have some theories on that, but they're just theories and you'll have, probably have to wait till I, my book comes out till you hear those. Uh, I'll back them up with the research as I always do. But um uh, there is a good reason that we should actually increase our protein intake as we age, um, especially in men. Okay, so the study showed those consuming a high animal protein diet had a 400% increase in cancer death risk. Cancer death risk, not just getting cancer, dying from it. But the same study, and I'll read it, quote verbatim, these associations were either abolished or attenuated if the proteins were plant derived. Now that's the big indicator here. 400% increase if they're animal-based proteins and not so much or not at all if they are plant proteins. So the type of protein is making a huge difference here. So it's not just the, the meat itself, it's not just the eggs itself, it's not just the dairy itself, it's the actual proteins themselves coming from animals that are linked to four times higher, 400% increase in cancer death risk when you're eating a high animal protein uh, based diet. Okay, 
Now, one of the reasons why is IGF-1. Remember, this study was about IGF-1, right? The reduction of uh, lower protein means lower IGF-1. But why the high amount, they looked at the same amount of high animal protein and high same amount, gram for gram, of the plant protein. Why did it not increase IGF-1? There's another thing that balances IGF-1 in the human body. It's called the IGF-1. There's your IGF-1 binding protein oh cool a binding protein or igf1 bp binding protein so there are a couple of different binding proteins but it actually binds to that igf1 and holds it so that it can't be used by cancer cells this is a protective measure is there a difference between vegans and non-vegans yes big difference Multiple studies in both men and women show that those consuming a plant pure diet, vegan diet, were actually up to 40% higher in binding proteins. That means that IGF-1 is bound and it can't be used by the cancer cell. It will only break off and be used when needed and become unbound when needed and used for the appropriate links like exercise you want igf1 you want mTOR activation that's what helps us recover and repair and build a healthy fit uh, body so that's the appropriate difference and big difference between that now some studies suggest that actually it is the fiber the high amount of fiber that's in a plant-based diet that is increasing the production of the binding proteins to protect and make those IGF-1 bound so that the safer and they do not uh, feed cancer cell growth. Okay, so let's go on to that. Well, there's IGF-1 in a plant-based, it's better because you have more binding proteins. There's uh, the um, mTOR pathway. If you're exercising, you're gonna greatly reduce that because then your mTOR is being used to actually do its proper function and not get engaged by uh, that. And obviously dairy has very specific, same with eggs. What is an egg? An egg is a baby chicken that's gonna grow to a full-size chicken rapidly. Rapid growth is not a great idea by putting that into your body if you have cancer cells present. And that rapid growth signaling is going to tell those cancer cells to also rapid growth as well as your healthy cells. So yes, I get that bodybuilders think, oh, eggs, rapid growth, dairy, rapid growth. That's what I want. No, you don't want that. Um, you're going to, unless you want to uh, look good in a casket. Um, that's, that's not where I want to end up. I want to enjoy this life. I exercise for health. I exercise for fitness so that I can be around and enjoy uh, all of the fruits of what I've accomplished so far in my life. That's what I want for you. And that's why I'm giving you this information so you can make empowered choices for yourself. But what else does contribute to prostate cancer? Well, we know DHT or dihydrotestosterone. This is a metabolite of, of testosterone. Now, what is DHT4? DHT4 is used uh, during uh, puberty in men to actually masculinize men. It is what we call androgenic. Andro, male, genic, change. So it changes us to a man. <laughs> it takes us from being a boy and changes us to a man. Deeper voice. Uh, stronger, bigger muscles, um, uh, hair on the body, uh, hair growth, <laughs> uh, facial hair growth, all those are DHT stimulated. Uh, for that reason, women don't want DHT. But men, once we get past puberty, really don't have a necessary function too much for a whole lot of DHT. So naturally, our DHT levels should decline with age because we're just not using it. But what is happening is because we're eating all these animal products, feeding our body with toxins and not exercising, a lot more of our testosterone, instead of being used for the appropriate things, muscle repair, uh, longevity, and things like that, that is being converted into DHT, which then can overstimulate the prostate. And I'm going to go ahead and put the picture up on there uh, because the picture kind of shows uh, exactly what 
this is supposed to look like. Uh, the top one is a healthy prostate um, uh, above with a bladder above it, the large circle there on the left-hand side of the picture, and then the unhealthy prostate. Uh, you can see it's in a hyperplasic state, which means it's uh, creating too many cells. Many of the cells are dying. Um, they're being overcrowded. They're inflamed. And it starts to enlarge the prostate, which pinches close uh, the uh, urethra where we urinate. And this causes a sense of feeling like we have to urinate all the time very quickly. Uh, has the stream come out very slowly or not at all, having to get up at night and pee a lot. All these problems are from um, a inflamed prostate, an unhealthy prostate. Um, so let's go back to uh, the comments section and hide this one. Okay, so what about DHT? How can we modulate DHT healthy? So DHT, so there's an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. It uh, can take our testosterone and convert it into DHT, dihydrotestosterone. That enzyme is required. Now, if we can inhibit that enzyme, block it, it will mean less conversion of that testosterone to DHT. Now, DHT not only causes prostate issues, it causes the leathering or toughening of the skin, the aging of the skin. Uh, more wrinkling of the skin. So DHT, not too good for skin appearance, uh, if that's important to you. DHT overstimulates hair follicles till the, finally they just give up. And that's called male pattern baldness. It's just DHT related. Uh, DHT also can cause overproduction of oil in the skin. And then DHT will cause, can cause acne. So you've got you know, a DHT causing can't pee, <laughs> bladder and bladder uh, situations, prostate uh, problems, uh, bad skin, acne, balding. These are all not very good things. What we want to do is make sure we get that DHT back into its healthy range. And are there some things in the plant kingdom that can help? Well, when I was doing my research, when I was working for one of the top sports nutrition companies um, in the United States, I came across this study uh, that was buried in the archives of the University of Israel, and it was amazing. It found that this cactus flower, the Apuntia cactus, it's that paddle cactus that you see. It's got all those little uh, round paddles on it. You see it uh, in cartoons and everything, too. Not this guaro cactus that look like standing human beings, but the ones with little paddles, little flat round paddles. That is the Apuntia cactus. Now, the Apuntia cactus has a flower, and that flower is its sex organ. That sex organ is really good at controlling its hormones. Now, when the researchers said, well, if that's the case, does it translate to humans? Meaning, if we consume it, will it help control our hormones as well as it does the plant's hormones? And a lot of times, that's not the case. It doesn't translate from, from species. But in this case, it actually does. Uh, this plant, this flower, actually produces both of the enzymes that cause that uh, it inhibitors that block the change of both testosterone to estrogen as well as DHT. So let's take a look at the study. So these are the results of the study. So they did a human cell study in human prostate tissue, and they looked at uh, uh, how well this cactus flower lowered the conversion when testosterone was produced, uh, put onto the uh, prostate tissue in the cell. This is in vitro. So there's a human cell studies looking directly at prostate tissue and found it reduced the conversion to DHT by over 80%. Now, this is pretty amazing. Uh, now, this was a cell study. So what they wanted to do next was say, okay, well, is this effective in vivo, which is in real living human beings? Um, so let's see, here's the in vivo research. I'm gonna go ahead and put this up on the screen. The comment section.
And so they had, based on two human clinical trials that were done, uh, 58 men with BPH uh, for six to eight months and one on 30 uh, men with BPH for two months. Uh, the Opuntia ficus indica flower extract, that's the DM33. That is our registered trademarked ingredient. DM33 is only found in cell block 80. You can see cell block 80 with DM33. That was what was used in the study. That is our trademarked ingredient. Nobody else has it, only found in cell block 80. It reduced urinary urgency. That is when your prostate swells, it means there's a lot of pressure for the urine to try to come out, but it can't because the swollen prostate is blocking the passageway. So it reduced that urgency by 80% two published human clinical trials. That's amazing. So that shows us the in vitro, this human cell research on prostate was actually showing us it works in humans too as well in two independent studies, clinical trials. Um, so that's pretty amazing that it's blocking uh, the conversion. So that means more of your testosterone stays as testosterone. Less of it is being lost to DHT conversion and less of it is meaning less DHT being created that would overstimulate that prostate and cause it to swell and inflame causing BPH. So pretty amazing stuff that this flower, this little cactus flower could do this. But it's also a nice benefit because by reducing the amount that is lost to DHT means increasing the amount that remains as testosterone. And not only did it block the DHT, but it also blocked, I'm gonna go ahead and put this uh, screenshot up. It also blocked the aromatase enzyme, which converts testosterone to, to um, estrogen. So this is really unique in that if you look at some of the uh, alpha reductase inhibitors, those that are trying to reduce um, just DHT, when you reduce just DHT, you can actually force the conversion of testosterone to even more estrogen that higher amount of estrogen actually suppresses testosterone. Okay, why is that important? Well, if you think of it as a hose with uh, two holes in it, right? Two holes in the wall, and you want the water to come out here, <laughs> right? You want the testosterone to go to the muscle tissue, but it's not getting there because you got two holes. One hole is uh, uh, your testosterone converting to estrogen, the other hole over here is testosterone converting to DHT. Now, if you block just the DHT, you get more coming out of the uh, other side in estrogen. So you don't want to block just the DHT, otherwise you get more, even more conversion to estrogen, which then can lower your or suppress your testosterone. So this is the negative side effects of potential negative side effects of just blocking DHT. But when you block both, now you don't get that and you actually get more testosterone, which can be a prosexual, can be more libido, can be more uh, energy, can be more strength, can be more muscle tissue, lower body fat, all of the benefits that you're looking for, better sleep, better self-confidence, all of those benefits by naturally balancing through an herbal uh, extract, balancing that so you optimize your levels, stop the, uh, minimize the conversion up to DHT and estrogen, and that way you're getting optimal levels of testosterone with, with remaining healthy levels of estrogen and DHT. So that's what I came up with. And, and so this is why it's really important uh, to take a look at this. This is a high risk category for men. Um, so if you are male or not male and you love a male, <laughs> if you have a, a father, a son, a brother, uh, a loved one, uh, a husband, uh, talk to them about this because it is a big cancer risk uh, and cancer death risk for men 
And I want to see people live a long and healthy life. And it's very clear that a plant-based diet can help and that these herbs and uh, nutritional uh, approaches can help too as well. Uh, Subblock 80 and vegan D3. You want a healthy prostate, those are supplements for healthy prostate. So check them out. Let me know what you think. I've been using it for almost 10 years. I love the product. My testosterone is in a healthy uh, stage. Obviously, I couldn't build 17 inch arms at 59 without any drugs in my system at all. Word it not if I didn't have healthy and appropriate hormone levels, optimized hormone levels across the board. Thanks for watching. I hope you got something good out of this. Uh, I'll see you next week with some really cool new studies also that just came out as well. Always trying to get you the latest in research because it'll give you the most updated information instead of some of the outdated information that it keeps circulating on the internet. I always try to present you with what we've learned from the latest research and how it compares to what we thought we knew with the old research. Thanks for watching. See you next week.